they are in whatever time zone they are with minimal time for a sync. Like on a regular day, we'd want just a 15 minute sync. On a, on a special day, maybe like PI planning, we advocate a one or two hour sync if the team is sufficiently large. But it forces the implementation of lean principles, like I would say visualization, whip limits, reducing batch size and managing your queue lengths to the max. You know? So you're going to need really awesome trained facilitators and, and experts to do this work better and better. It's going to, uh, in my experience, it's going to make companies more awesome, make teams more awesome. You know? And then you still have your personal life to deal with. And there's, for instance, one of the simple benefits is if you have a 100% train and everybody is commuting one hour a day, that's a hundred hours saved right there for the human beings, not the corporation, for the human beings. You know, that's really an awesome benefit of doing this. Yep. I hope that helps, Susan. Yes, thank you, Sadash. Awesome. So let me now move to the third question. Hi, kid. You can see this. This is what I mean by. Sorry, if I if I go back to the same slide, Siraj. Yeah. So when we look at this, where do you see most of the people nowadays? So I know that we are targeting um, the the second cubicle. Yeah. Where do you see us moving towards? And um, a sequence, a subsequent question: How that will impact our human life when we go go back to to what we used to be? Yeah, so I would say I see all the people in all the quadrants, but the best ones are moving towards quadrant number two more and more and more. And for that, you know, uh, it takes high amount of uh, consciousness of the leaders, the practitioners, leveraging tools to the max. And then what was your second question, Mark? I was paying attention to the first one. Um, how that will affect our um, normal life when we go back to, to the human interaction, when we are um, out of this, let's say, and we are back, actually. Do you see yeah. um, that will affect our future interactions? Thank you. That is a great question. So as I was telling Susan, in the present scenario, I think it will affect a lot because people are uh, more interested in their safety the safety of their families, obviously the safety of their colleagues. So we will not have an opportunity for that amount of, uh, I'd say, face-to-face -face interaction. But once the coronavirus situation goes on, I do see face-to-face, -face, but it's not a compulsion. You know, you and I and all of us here, we are going to have to develop skills to become very good in digital conversations. And then maybe I would say it would probably reduce down to once a year, like a company meeting or an annual staff meeting or something where we, you know, get our social needs of the community met. And, and to me, that's actually a mature behavior because we are not wasting time. We are taking advantage of talent where the talent is. We are going to the talent, you know, now, uh, for example, I see some people here like Fadi's from Egypt, you're from Canada, I'm in India. I'm sure there are people in other parts of the world that are on this call, right? But you're taking advantage of talent and, and making sure that the talent is able to show up on this. Is that good, Mark, or do you have other thoughts to share? No, thanks a lot. Cool. Okay. So now let's come to uh, practice, right? So Mark said this is a community of practice. So I believe in practice and rehearsal. If you want to do this really well, then you can see over here, you know, me and my uh, team of facilitators, we look at every aspect. We basically script the work by, you could say, minutes or sessions or what have you, and then we rehearse the whole thing, right? And so basically what we are doing is we're making sure that people get the right experience during the time of interaction and synchronization. This is really important because what you're doing is you're taking advantage of the time when everybody comes together to maximize synchronization, collaboration, and leverage the human power of this network. We'll talk more about this as we go along, but the important point is to practice and to provide rehearsal. Next one is our back office readiness, right? 
um, as you grow in the size of people that are going to do this work, you're going to have to have multiple tools in place. Like if you see over here, we've got, you know, multiple devices, multiple monitors, multiple screens, you know, uh, high availability and, and uh, business continuity planning in place. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that if one channel drops, another channel can pick it up, you know, uh, and, and I'm a big proponent of using technology for what it's worth. Your organizations are making immense investment in technology. I'd like to make sure that we really, really uh, take advantage of every dollar of investment in technology. And I imagine that in order to do, let's say, uh, PI planning for a thousand people spread across the world, you're going to need something like this or maybe something even larger like a control room. And that's something that we are working on to create the control room to enable global corporations to do PI planning at any time that they want. Okay, you guys ready for number seven? Okay, so number seven to me is the one of the most important aspects of doing hybrid human and digital powers. And that to me is face reading. Everyone who is involved in this is going to have to get better and better and better at developing face reading skills. Like you can see over here, Fadi, I think you're wearing the same t-shirt as yeah. in this picture. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I can see Varsha and Sandrine and Susan, you know, from this picture. But the intention is, you know, you're going to create an, an ability to see how people are doing by looking at them. And to me, this is leveraging the power of internet much, much more than what was happening in the face-to-face -face environment market, like what you were asking them. I'm always looking at all these people and trying to see, okay, what do I need to engage with? Whom do I need to bring into the conversation? Who is uh, showing signs of fatigue, for instance? Because you don't always want people to be on video like this. Maybe you don't need people to be on video. Maybe they can shut off video and just engage in um, the listening style of learning. You don't need to have uh, video all the time, right? All right, let me pause here and see if there are any questions about face reading, because to me, this is a awesome way to bring the human power into a digital technology-based conversation. Uh, yeah, I think Siraj, uh, because yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing the same shirt, so I may go first as usual. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I have gone through uh, being interacting and difficulties of some People, they don't need to be seen all the time. So yeah. in breakup groups, yeah. for spe specifically, I'm not talking about the whole class, but in breakup groups, yeah. uh, I remember our experience, which it was marvelous experience. Yeah. I, I'm really, I'm really uh, witnesses a marvelous experience with you and your team. But in breakup group, you advising to have uh, people whose faces or you're just asking facilitator to keep people in what they want. Because in the main room, yeah, I mean, the momentum may go from others. But in a breakup, I think people need to see each other more. So how we yeah. can come over it? That's a great point, Fadi. And you know, I'll go back a little bit. And just to clarify again, Fadi, it's not breakup, it's breakout. You can do a breakup room, but I call it a breakout room. right? And uh, this goes back to the culture of the large group and the small group, right? Each small group is a micro culture and each small group has its own working agreements. Like your breakout group number one might have a culture of always video on, right? And now people can self-select to be in that group or not, you know? And to me, that is the, again, evolution and maturity of team behavior that we talk about in the physical face-to-face -face world. And I think it's really important. So in the main room, I set very simple uh, working agreements where we trust people to take care of themselves and to show up the best that they can. So if it's a video on, that's fine. If it's no video, that's fine. You want to bring your children in, that's fine. You want to bring your pets in, that's fine, right? And then we allow for minimal uh, involvement of other elements 
into the main room. But in the breakout room, as you were saying, Fadi, maybe as a facilitator, you want video on, and then you can share that expectation to people and see who's interested in that. Maybe there are a bunch of people interested in your approach, but then maybe there are people who are not interested in your approach, so they can go to another room, right? You, you really want to create a culture that is inclusive and has the diversity that we humans are, right? Like uh, right now, for me, it's 4 a.m. in the morning. I might not want a video right now, but it looks like you are in full flow and you want a video. So try to respect diversity is what I would say. Hmm? Yeah, okay. thank you. Was there another question on face reading? But Raj, I do have a question about this because I feel that uh, the investment, as you mentioned, right, yeah. in the uh, kind of control center yeah. is an important part of this, but it's not the only part. Thank you. You sure make sense. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what are the things that you're looking for? Aside from that might be on the uh you know that but what are you looking for when you are doing uh the kind of face as a as a yeah. skill uh mark is it possible to mute some people there is some uh, audio disturbance thank you yes yeah, sure okay. thank you okay so uh what i'm looking for is leadership authentic leadership, right? Now, you take uh, going to our investment, right? Not everyone might be able to afford this kind of technology and investment. I know companies that, that, that can and I know companies that cannot. If you don't have this kind of investment, you're going to have to bring a lot of human power and facilitation to the table, right? And to me, facilitation skill number one is face reading, always being in touch with the people. That's your window into what's happening to your human worker on the other side, right? And then you're constantly like checking in with people, making sure that the culture is right, making sure that people can communicate what they want to be successful. So it goes back to leadership, it goes back to authenticity and, and showing up as a, as a true human member of a community that you want to belong to. That's what it is for me, Susan. There's, there's a huge investment on the part of the human leaders to come into this program. Hmm? Okay, shall we move on? Okay, so Raj, uh, um, one quick question. Sorry. Um, okay. sorry, you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you you have done so many classes in person also, and uh, you've done these classes virtually. Yeah. I had a privilege to teach with you in one of the yeah. virtual courses too. Um, have in, in your experience, uh, like, you know, a face-to-face -face, uh, class versus a virtual class, yeah. which one did you feel like, you know, the face reading was much needed and much more helpful? Um, or do you think uh, both are the same? I think both are the same. You know, I'm very much someone who is pragmatic, who wants to bring in, uh, you know, tactics of delivery and engagement based on the context. And if it was a really small group, uh, maybe a group of executives with very high impact decision making who are ready to invest in global travel and face to face, I'm absolutely for it. But for a team of, oh, for an agile release train of, let's say, a thousand people working across multiple locations like what we are doing right now, I, I can't see that happening. It's too much. The, the, the benefits and the costs don't align for me, Seisha. You know, you have Perfect. to see, like, what's the benefit you're going to get, you know, like for okay. one particular client that we're doing PI planning now for uh, 400 people, it won't align. It just won't align, you know. Perfect. So you, you feel like this is the way to go. And in future, this is probably, it. Yeah. okay, wonderful. wonderful. But Thank remember, you. you can also have a blended. I'm also looking at the next level for the blended, which is small groups of people in different locations can come together. Right? Okay. But then, you know, let's say we have clusters of people in like where you are in Jersey, Toronto, where Mark is, Egypt, where Fadi is. I think Sandy and Susan are in the DC area. So they meet together. You see, people
people can meet in Perfect. different locations and then you can still leverage this face reading approach but okay. in a different way. Perfect. Thank you. So Siraj, I have a comment yeah. if you allow me and I have a question. Sure. Um, I think down to Sisha's point, um, yeah. uh, if I take it in a different way just to answer this question, yeah. um, when I teach a class in person, there's a lot I can pay attention to. Not only yeah. the face, the body language, um, yeah. the way they're moving on, the, the way they're head, the way they're reading their book. In yeah. here, when you are actually completely just on the camera, you have to spend a lot of time just looking at the faces and try to read all what you could read in, in person from yeah. just a face, kind of. Yeah. Which is, um, I think, a different set, and this is where my question is. Because when we speak about face reading, um, it can have variable meanings and it can go different level, even in depth. So to which level uh, you think the minimum can be, if I may ask this question? Um, I'm not sure I know which level, Mark. Could you ask again uh, with a different way? So, so as an example, sometimes you have, um, um, you're looking at faces, you can read their eye movement, you can read where their kind of interest is, if they're actually um, kind of connected to what you're saying or they are distracted or they are actually not following for a certain reason. There is a, like, a deeper level where you can uh, actually read more out of their faces. So yeah. what will be kind of the bare minimum in, in that example? Um, I'll just go back a little bit. Let me see if I can try to answer your question, right? So one thing I would recommend, as I was saying earlier, is multiple facilitators, right? So in this case, for instance, we have five facilitators and each one of them, when they're in the main room, is watching the faces of all the people and they're working as a collaborative facilitation team to look at signals from everyone. When you go into a small room, then each facilitator is looking at five to seven faces and learning from that, right? This collective intelligence to me is what I think can mature over a period of time. And I rely on this collective intelligence of the facilitation team to enhance the experience of everyone significantly. And I think that the collective intelligence of the facilitation team is much, much more powerful than you or me as one person facilitating a workshop. And like I've noticed in this case, for instance, with five or six facilitators in the room, the observation, the dynamics, right? And the whole experience is tremendously powerful. For example, I always believe that, um, you know, there's a saying about uh, airlines. I have a lot of airline background in my life. There's a saying about airlines that the survey says, an informal survey says that if an airline goes down, it's when the main pilot is flying, right? But when the co-pilot is flying, the airline doesn't go down. So here, if you're the main pilot facilitating and you're by yourself, there's high likelihood of the whole approach not working for you. Whereas if you build a unit that has the ability to point out, to give communication to the main facilitator and channels that engage and empower people to create that kind of authentic leadership that we want as a facilitation group, I think it can be really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks a lot, Siraj. Yeah. Yeah. And even with the face-to-face -face, uh, facilitation, I would absolutely recommend at least two facilitators. I think the pair model of facilitating, being able to bounce ideas, being able to, you know, see what's going on with the other person and checking in with the other person, I think is very valuable in the face-to-face -face world. As, as you see, I'm actually advocating in the future a blended approach when it's safe to do so. Okay. Is that good, Mark? Excellent. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Has, All right. Next. Have, yeah, go ahead, Susan. No, go ahead. Before you go on. Yeah. So uh, what you were saying about the um, remote PI planning yeah. in group uh, hit something. And that 
that, you know, all of these things that you're going through, uh, you know, is around, uh, you know, class, cl class delivery, however, it applies no matter what, right? Yeah. And so when I think about uh, preparing for remote PI planning, and yeah. whether people are grouped in geographic locations or grouped by virtual uh, yeah. breakout, or whatever the case may be, right? That pr to me, that practice and rehearsal is yeah. is key, as well yeah. as having you know a really solid group of facilitators uh, to to help, right? To kind of help get everybody through the script of PI planning. Oh yeah, absolutely. And to me, this is absolutely doable uh, from people who are just starting out. It just takes a lot of hard work, practice, dedication to the art and science of hybrid facilitation, according to me. Yeah, thank you. So next is the choice of tools. You know, we have to be intentional in leveraging tools. Like for instance, you know, one of the ceremonies that we all do is the problem solving workshop. So here we are leveraging tools that can make people awesome. That's, that's our intention. We're not leveraging tools because the tool is awesome. The, the digital serves the human. That's the approach that we have. Like in this case, you know, you can see that we are allowing the tools to exist as long as they serve the purpose of conversation between the humans. Once the, the tool has its presentation and visualization aspect done, we take it to the background and we go back to face reading and, and engage in human conversations. Okay? Let me bring one more up as of this. I'm a big believer in asynchronous working and a big believer in outcome seeking behavior of the whole group, right? So now the, the main uh, uh, event that all of us work with is PI planning as Susan was talking about. So in addition to all the practice, rehearsals, leverage of tools and face reading, I think one good behavior is to be asynchronous in doing the work and synchronizing at the right time. Like in this case, for instance, for PI planning, I advocate four synchronization sessions, small synchronization sessions, so that over a period of one week with maybe an investment of one to two hours a day, a global team can synchronize around four aspects. That's outcome seeking behavior, right? On day one, we are synchronizing around compelling shared vision. Are all of us involved and invited into a compelling shared vision? You know, Steve Jobs says a good vision pulls you. You don't need to push yourself. So is the vision compelling enough to pull you into this work for the next PI? The second one, second day is to seek alignment, right? So now that you understand the vision, how do we align each other? And if not, what kind of adjustments and problems do we need to solve? So that's the third day. And then on the fourth day, we seek commitment from the whole Agile Release Train or Trains. Right? And by doing this, we are allowing a distributed model to flourish. We are allowing people to work in their time zones. We are respecting their boundaries of human and family commitments. And at the same time, you will see the power of tools, the power of technology. Like what I've seen is, you know, the tools that we use like LeanKit, Slack, WhatsApp, Google Drive, all of that just exploding when people are ready to work in their time zones, right? And we've seen how a, a, a distributed program board comes into play at the different time zones, and then they come into a session, a common session, and then they seek alignment or they adjust on things that are necessary. And then this style of working really forces an organization to be clear about how do we apply lean and lean techniques to our work? You cannot, you cannot you know, stuff the delivery pipeline with a lot of features and epics. You've got to make sure that you're doing just the right thing. This model also forces the organization to absolutely decide, hey, what are we intending to do in the next PI? It's not work for work itself. What's the outcome we want to have at the end of this PI. Hmm? Let me pause here. I'm sure there are one or two questions on remote PI planning.
Well, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I really love this uh, idea of asynchronous work, Siraj, yeah. because so often when people see this and they see the agenda mm. and they're thinking it's got to just be a continuous stream and yeah. every, everybody's got to be involved at all times, yeah. regardless of if they're distributed or not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, um, I just, I love that, you know, actually you don't have to, you know, you've got to build in that sync time as you were describing, but let yeah. people do their work in the way that they want to, they're comfortable, uh, the environment within which they can be successful, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you know, I just... Looking at uh, uh, working parents with small children, the, the times that they're available to work is actually unpredictable, right? So when they are available, they come in, they work asynchronously, and they complete their work. And, and this is the true power of hybrid and remote style work. Thank you. Good. What else? I think that actually the discussion that Susan, her question and her comment, remind me always with what we do with, in a value stream mapping, where we are looking at hands-off. And currently yeah. we are discovering that a lot of what we do is a hands-off, actually. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right, let's go to number 10. Number 10 to me is hyper-global and hyper-local, right? So one of the things with your distributed events is the presentation of the timing of events. So what we do again is we leverage location-based technologies to display to you when is an event happening in your time zone. Like if you see here, I'm able to see when events are happening in the night and when events are happening during my day. That's because we are leveraging the digital technologies of today to present to you an opportunity to decide when do you want to participate? When do you want to come in? And when do you not want to come in because you want to respect your boundaries? So this hyper-global, hyper-local, hyper-sensitivity to the market and to the individual is going to be really important. You present like the entire PI planning calendar that I showed you, you present it to each person in their time zone, not in, not in a global time zone, not in a dominant time zone, but in their time zone. And then the last one is care mode. That's what this is going to take. You know, If you're looking at what kind of an investment it's going to take, it's going to take tremendous amount of human and leadership investment. You know, People don't care how much you know and what you can do and what you can invest until they know how much you care. And it's going to take that for the organizations of today and tomorrow to show how much you care, not just in yourself and your profits, but in human satisfaction, in employee satisfaction, in customer satisfaction, and becoming a social citizen and contributing to the community. Okay? I think that's all I have. So Mark and Susan and Fadi and everyone, just go ahead and ask questions and we can have a nice conversation about this. Thanks yes. a lot, um, Siraj. I think that's that's bring a lot of aspects to life. And I think a lot of what you um, put here together, um, at least many of us had experienced that, but just seeing it in front of us as a structured idea is really very powerful and make you really take the time to reflect back and yeah. think about everything you said and how that actually applied to our life in different ways. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Be, thank you, Mark. We are going to have to be highly aware of how much we are ready to invest and how much we expect from others and the kind of uh, authenticity and transparency and disclosure that's required for this is tremendous, actually. Yeah, thank you, Siraj. Uh, actually, right. it was uh, it brings me when you're going through your presentation my personal experience because yeah. uh, we have met over Zoom. <laughs> we didn't met in life right now. But uh, I have a question actually about how to keep a momentum. And, and this is actually, I discussed it with Martina, uh, yeah. Dr. Martina, okay. Uh, yeah. How you keep a momentum for nine hours? Yeah. 
because so because me, it was crazy for me to stay in, and I I couldn't believe for two three days that I don't have to stay with Siraj and the team for like <laughs> nine hours <laughs> from afternoon to midnight in my time. Uh, for me, it's my uh, I stay till midnight every day for four yeah. days, four consecutive days. How yeah. how you manage it? Well, uh, from a science point of view, we are scripting every minute of the interaction. Okay, that's what this is. Practice, rehearsal, and scripting, right? So we script the main room work, we script the breakout room work, we script the use of tools, we script face reading time. It's all scripted, okay? And Fadi, in your case, you know, if you're doing this, let me know, I can share my script with you because I absolutely want you to be successful. But then modify the script for your work, okay? But the second thing to me is face reading. You're going to have to read the face because the momentum is driven by the culture of the people in your group, right? Mm. Like for example, for PI planning, I'm advocating four days, but some people came back and said, no, we can't do four days, we need five. And that's perfectly fine. It's your context, it's your momentum. The speed of engagement you know, is your speed. The, the organization has a speed, as we say, the cadence at which it moves, and we respect that pace. Great question, by the way, Fadi. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, may I ask, ask for something else? Because I, I'm yeah, still, sure, sure. I, I, yeah. it, because it's, it's more, it, it was more than class for me. Uh, yeah. in, the, in the first day, I, I remember uh, to, to the rest of the team who are here, uh, I took with class, yeah. S, uh, with Siraj SBC class. And in the first day, we have like in a breakout, um, I think every one hour and a half or, oh, uh, no. In two hours, we take like 15 minutes break. Yeah, uh, and oh. then we move, and second day, uh, it, it, it was a very hectic from, uh, as I want yeah. to explain my uh, experience, it was very hectic in the first day, consecutive hours, uh, very um, large amount of information, but then yeah. second day, Siraj just moved it to one hour and 10 minutes break, so oh, 50 minutes and 10 minutes break, and actually, yeah. it, it, it makes a huge leap in my personal experience, because I was able to get a rest in every hour for 10 minutes. Uh, as it goes after the first um, rehearsal with your uh, team, after the first workshop or the first day of training, or is it already planned? We have scenario A, we have scenario B, we have scenario C. Yeah, we have multiple uh, plans for that. And you know what we're doing is, experimenting with various Pomodoro techniques of learning. Uh, and mm -hmm. the primary ones are 25-5, which means 25 minutes of facilitation, five minutes of break, 50-10, or like what you were describing, you know, uh, two hours and then 15 minutes. So we have multiple, we see what the crowd wants. You know, we rely a lot on the face reading skills to judge what type of Pomodoro will work for what type of a culture. Yeah. Mm. One more great question. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm sure, Mark, do we have any more questions or you want to take it from here? I have one more, Siraj, yeah, and sure. really um, around the role of leadership in this hybrid world. Yeah. Uh, what do you feel are the kind of key components or skills, capabilities of a, a leader of an organization who's trying to make the pivot to hybrid? Uh, yeah, I can tell you that immediately that the first one is sharing. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to share leadership with everyone. It's no longer that you're the boss. Mm -hmm. Everyone in this uh, environment is a leader and they show up at one particular time and then they lead the container in that particular way. So if you have a hundred people, you're creating a hundred leaders and each person is assuming leadership at some particular time. Now you cannot script that. You're going to have to allow the emergence. Mm -hmm. So then sharing is first, respecting the emergence is second. Something is emerging and you're always looking for that something. Uh, how shall I say? You're, you're waiting for the surprise, you know? So good leaders 
are able to take the surprise. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for that. Great question. I'll add it to the next round of presentation. You know, so it's sharing, emergence, surprise. Good. What else? So I guess um, down to um, Fadi's point, and I think this is a great point uh, because I think every practitioner who conducts classes, and here are actually are a few of my students also, um, and nothing compared to you, Siraj, but um, we do the same, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Based on the first day, based on the feedback we get, uh, we actually adjust the class, sometimes based on the people. So some models work with certain people and do not work with everyone. And yeah. I think exactly what you mentioned, that um, this type um, and this collective effort from you and all the facilita facilitator is yeah. actually uh, the power. Um, one more point, if you allow me to add, is yes. actually when you mentioned the preparation. So yeah. usually we, we prepare a lot, but we get into the habit that we know this thing, there's nothing new for me, so I skip the preparation. And I yeah. think teaching, teaching specially um, and conducting those interview and those rehearsal, um, like even, even for Siraj, how many iterations he went to in order to prepare this presentation. And this is kind of, um, he can flow it at the back of his mind. And I think preparation um, is, is a key to everything we do, no matter how much we know the subject, how we think we are able to conduct. Still, if you prepare one more, you will find something in it. Thank you, Mark. I absolutely appreciate that because you know we met on Monday. We started sharing the Google Drive between all of us, and we did asynchronous updates. If you remember to the presentation, right? So we don't want to trouble each other a lot. We have synced up once on Monday, and we're going to sync up again on Thursday. And between that time. It's all asynchronous work. And my team is doing asynchronous work. You're giving feedback. I got your emails, everybody's emails. But this kind of rehearsal and practice and coming in with a beginner's mind, you know, I've done it before, but I'm going to learn something new. Now, like in this class, Fadi's question about pace. What's the momentum of this? That's a new learning for me. Or Susan's question about sharing, uh, um, you know, allowing for emergence and surprise. That's a new thing. And I want to add that to this knowledge base. Okay. Any other questions, Mark or friends? Hey, Sarai, this is Ziad. Hi, Ziad, how are you? Hi, how, good, how are you doing? Good. Uh, good, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the great content. Uh, it's just, uh, this is more of a thought than a question because um, everyone keeps talking about when this is over and we're going to go back to normal. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not really sure if normal is going to be normal anymore um, mm -hmm. with what's going on. Um, you look at um, the amount of investment that organizations are now making into um, moving um, uh, the workforce in, um, into working from home or working remotely. And um, it doesn't seem that this is going to be reversed when this is all over. So it's interesting. I mean, I would like to hear your thoughts about how do you think or how do you envision the new normal is going to be? Because the, 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 what we used to call normal, I don't really think that this is really valid anymore. Mm. So my suggestion is to stay open to what can emerge. Definitely, because yeah. The amount of diversity in our population is, I'd say, about... 8.3 billion or whatever is the population now, you know, that many types of variations can happen and you're going to have to accept the variation. For example, what you're describing about the new normal to me exists mm -hmm. in one of these four quadrants. Like some of mm -hmm. us will actually prefer face-to-face -face human interaction. And for them, you have the office, you have the conference rooms, you have co-working spaces, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, hotels, all that, right? So they will go there. A few of us are learning that this is really awesome. I'm actually enjoying remote work from anywhere. You know, like for example, I'm doing all my work from India and I'm not feeling any lag, any delay. You know, I'm able to flex and work whenever I can. Like right now it's 4.30 in the morning. It's 6 p.m. in my regular U.S. home, but mm. work is happening or 7 p.m. maybe, right? Mm. So it, I think 
the main thing is going to be to appreciate the power of personal preference and diversity and the organization of tomorrow is going to have to flex and be open to that i i, I totally agree i mean it, yeah. the uh, um the establishing that uh, the new norms are going to be yeah. different and yeah. we need to be yeah. significantly much more flexible in terms of what constitutes work and what is yeah. quote unquote normal for work yeah. and not yeah. being limited and, and i think we have really seen that i mean it was yeah. baptism by fire but at the end of the yeah. day this is what we had to do to deal with yeah. thank you yeah. uh, ziad i don't know where you are but i'm in india right now i'm in i'm in toronto i'm in toronto, toronto. Awesome. yeah awesome so you know the recent uh, uh, weather surveys in india say that the mm. pollution level is at a 20 year low i we can talk about this that's one of my favorite subject i mean <laughs> the 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 pollution in the gta area have dropped in average 30 to 40% oh my the god the animals are not in distress uh, wow. you look at the waterways and they are clear there was oh, pictures wow. coming out from venice which yes. have one of the most polluted waterways yeah. right at least in the western world and the water is clear it's yeah. it's, it's it's phenomenal to see yeah. how fast environment have recovered just we once we just you know just took a step back and stopped crushing the environment yeah. the way we yeah. do yeah and maybe if i jump here ziad sorry yeah. siraj how much time we have saved so for us for example for you yeah. if you are commuting yeah. every day to downtown how much time you've, you've converted from, for example, idle time to a productive time? Maybe productive time, not for work, at, but even for, for your personal else. life. Uh, I, I agree. And, and the stress, and taking yes. out the stress, because, for example, driving daily for an hour in the traffic, having to, to think about dropping the kids, see how much time you save. You're enjoying this time relaxed yeah. at your home. Totally yeah. agree, Mark. I mean, I mean, I think that for the vast majority of us, we can definitely do without the commute stress. And it yeah. doesn't really matter if you drive the car, which is something that 